I'm uh, going to speak this morning about the African Union summit that ended yesterday. The elections um, were very tight. Um, the, as everybody I think know by now, Musa Faki Mahama, the foreign minister of Chad, um, was elected chairperson. In the final round, he got 39 votes against 15 abstentions in the seventh round. Um, in the first round, Amina Mohammed of Kenya, uh, another favorite, led with 16 votes, with uh, Faki with 14. Um, and the Abdullah Batali from Senegal and Vincent Moitoy um, from Botswana both had 10. So very much uh, confined to the regions. Um, Central Africa was split because Muzafaki is also from Central Africa and Equatorial Guinea persisted with its candidate that didn't come in uh, six months ago in Kigali. And so Agapito Mbamokui only got um, three votes in the beginning. And then there was a runoff in the end. Um, Amina Mohammed initially leading the race from what we can understand. Um, and then in the end, uh, Musa Faki Mohammed won with 28 votes against 25. And then he stood alone and got the, um, the 39 uh, uh, votes in the seventh round. So a clear majority. Um, the fact that there were 15 abstentions in the last round, interestingly, as in 2012, when um, Tlamini Zuma was elected, shows actually that it is very hard to come by an, a consensus in the AU. And we know that previous years, before Tlamini Zuma's uh, confrontation with Jean Ping in 2012, this is how it always happened in a, on a consensus basis, uh, most of the decisions within the AU. Um, so why did Musa Faki win this race? Because ahead of the elections, it seemed very clear that the two um, favorites were Abdullah Batali from Senegal and Amina Mohammed uh, from Kenya. Both of these candidates ran a very strong campaign, especially Amina Mohammed with the Kenyan media behind her. Um, she ran a campaign on social media, on Twitter, Batali also uh, in a certain way. Well, Musa Faki, who came in at the last minute, actually, and was the dark horse, ran a more conventional campaign, lobbying heads of state. Um, and he also um, had allies within the AU, strong uh, um, uh, friends that, and uh, allies that he built up during years that he, he actually served in the AU before on the Economic and Cultural Council, uh, ECOSOC, but also importantly, last year when Chad was leading the AU, Musafaki chaired the Executive Council and other meetings. So he was a well-known figure and he could actually show that he um, speaks French and English and Arabic, um, that he is pragmatic, that's how we see him. He's a, he's a more conventional politician. The AU is going to be run differently than Kosazana Tlamini Zuma. Um, that I think were more idealistic, looking at much more socioeconomic issues on a long-term agenda 2063, whereas Musa Faki is a strong candidate in the almost traditional sense of the word. And um, he is considered perhaps a consensus candidate, um, and he, he's, he's seen as, a, as strong. Chad um, has positioned itself as the military uh, strong country in the Sahel, sending troops to Mali, sending troops to um, against Boko Haram. We remember how um, Chad led that um, uh, Lake Chad Basin Commission intervention initially as the multi joint multinational force uh, got um, on up and running and that force is based in Chad even Operation Bachkan of the French is based in Chad. So Idris Debi has really um, positioned himself very strongly. And now he has his strong uh, ally, his foreign minister, who was prime minister uh, at some stage, also now as uh, chairperson of the AU Commission. And uh, briefly, the, um, the deputy then went to um, the candidate from Ghana uh, that that was an issue that might have counted against um, the uh, bid of 
Abdullah Batali. So Thomas Kwesi Kwerti uh, is now the deputy chair of the of the AU. Um, so in terms of the eight commissioners, the most interesting race was really for Commissioner of Peace and Security. Um, their, uh, Algeria is is was elected Shmael Shergi again and we know since 20, 2002 when the AU was created um, the Peace and Security Commission in the AU has always been run by Algerians um, something that Morocco has questioned even in the run-up to their um, campaign to to rejoin the AU but that aside um, at this election Nigeria um, made a very strong campaign to have Fatima um, Kairi Mohammed um, elected in this position. She's the ECOWAS um, head of peace and security. She had uh, 21 votes initially um, against the 31 votes of um, Shmael Shaggy. In fact, they had to run this election twice because there were some um, problems with the calculation. But in the end, uh, Shmael Shaggy got 36 votes. So in terms of um, the Peace and Security Commission, it is more or less um, business as usual. Um, so the other very important um, position was political affairs that is increasingly um, becoming an important commission in the, in the AU. Um, so Minata Samate Sesuma of Burkina Faso was elected uh, to the surprise of many because we had strong candidates like Angola's um, foreign minister, current representative to the UN, Antonio Tete, was very well known here in Addis. And um, we also have a former deputy chief of staff of Lamini Zuma at the AU, uh, Hesfina Rukato from Zimbabwe was running. So um, a surprising uh, win there. And interestingly, so we have uh, three Francophones, uh, Shmael Shergi, of course, from Algeria, also speaks French um, in top positions uh, in the AU. One of my colleagues noted that actually the political affairs department um, is almost 90% Anglophone, so it will be uh, interesting. This is always something that plays a role here in Addis Ababa. So um, of the eight commissioners, only six uh, were nominated because uh, there were four women and then four men, so uh, chairperson, deputy chairperson, peace and security, um, and then one of the other, um, I will get you the details, one of the other commissioners, also a male uh, candidate um, for trade and industry. The Chadian um, commissioner there was running for a second term, didn't get in because, of course, uh, Musafaki. Uh, and she was considered to be a good commissioner. So these issues always um, influence these decisions. Um, so two of the um, positions have been postponed now for six months. Um, it's human resources, science and technology and economic affairs. So some interim chair uh, will be nominated, um, chairperson for those two commissions then until um, July at the next summit. Interestingly, uh, importantly, neither South Africa nor Nigeria have now important positions on the AU Commission. Um, another important issue, I think, uh, to note is that um, for the first time in uh, the history of the AU, we are actually seeing real campaigning for key positions um, in the AU Commissions. That is a first for the AU. As I said, Nigeria's candidate was distributing flyers, they were on Twitter, before, honestly, outside of really the corridors of the AU Commission in Addis Ababa, few people paid any attention to who these commissioners uh, were. A word on the new AU uh, chairperson, the rotating chair, Alpha Conde. Um, he, Alpha Conde is a Pan-Africanist, a bit like Abdullahi Batili, with a long history and knows the continent well. He was in opposition to um, Lansana Conte for many years in Guinea. So it was interesting during the debate over Morocco's uh, adhesion to the um, African Union that um, but, um, Alpha Conde made some reconciliatory statements that show that he knows the continent well, as, as I'll note just now in the discussion on Morocco. Um, 
he, but so he's, he was seen as a strong Democrat, Alpha Conde, but since coming to power, there have been allegations of corruption, elections haven't gone well. He was also seen as a friend of Yaya Jame, um, that played a role in these last negotiations to get the Yaya Jame of the Gambia to leave the country. Um, so he um, will see, I think he, so far he's played a conciliatory role, I think in issues like the ICC and, um, uh, and Morocco. But um, he, and he said the right things, uh, uniting the continent um, for South Africa should be part of the UN Security Council, growth should translate into development, all those good things in his speech, but we'll have to see what happens now. Then um, briefly on the ICC, which um, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding, I think this morning especially, on exactly what the um, AU has decided. Because in January 2016, this issue of a collective withdrawal uh, from the ICC by member states was um, put on the table by Uhuru Kenyatta. South Africa agreed with it. There was a lot of talk in the corridors. Then in July as well, in Rwanda, the same issue came up. And um, do, during the Executive Council in Kigali, the decision was made again that this, the withdrawal strategies should now be um, uh, worked out by uh, a special open-ended ministerial committee of the uh, uh, ministerial committee. Then um, a draft was circulated of um, the proposed withdrawal strategy. This was adopted according to the um, provisional decisions of the assembly that we've seen. Um, so. But this really um, is is a is a very complicated um, concept, um, and and the experts uh, agree that uh, the AU cannot force uh, um, ICC member states to withdraw. So the African Union is not a member of the ICC; it's not a signatory of the Rome Statute. It is a sovereign decision by every member state to either. Uh, join the ICC or withdraw. So the withdrawal strategy is quite vague. There was a, um, a lot of debate and in the Executive Council last week, several countries spoke against a, collect, a call for a collective withdrawal, notably countries like Senegal, um, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, noted that um, the AU, they, they, they are not in favor of a collective withdrawal. Senegal especially uh, spoke here yeah, and last year against uh, uh, promoting the ICC. We know Senegal's Foreign Minister Sidiki Kaba is leading the state parties to the ICC. So, um, and Senegal also said it respects South Africa's decision to withdraw. So the decision was to adopt the withdrawal strategy but it is not a legal concept. So it's basically, from what we understand here in Addis Ababa at the summit, it's a political move by the AU member states that have for a long time criticized the ICC, called upon states not to arrest Omar al-Bashir, um, not to carry out the arrest warrant. It's been um, hanging for so long, this withdrawal strategy, that they now adopted it because they can't sort of go back on their word. But what does this really mean? They are, during this debate um, at the Executive Council, no other country stood up and said, we are going to withdraw. At this point, South Africa and Burundi are the only states that have withdrawn. Um, uh, the Gambia now has a new government and they are going to say they are going to uh, relook this. Even South Africa, during this debate, we are told, um, shifted slightly from its position saying, it's our sovereign decision, not calling on everybody to follow it. So there's a slight, a slight difference perhaps in tone. South Africa against emphasize it's not against impunity. Um, it made this decision for the reasons that it gave um, when it initially withdrawal. So, um, and Uru Kenyatta seems to be a little bit absent from the debate where, as I said, in January last year, um, Kenya was, was really pushing very strongly for this. So in the end, Alpha Conde, the chair, then um, 
uh, Sid uh, decided, announced that it will be adopted, but the countries that launched reservations will be officially noted and their names published in the final decisions of the assembly. So their, their reservations um, will be registered and it's official. The draft we've seen at this point um, notes Malawi, Tanzania, to, uh, Tunisia and Zambia requested more time to study the withdrawal uh, strategy and Liberia is noted as one that has reservations on the adoption but others um, are, are, are probably going to be added to this. So this is on the ICC very briefly. Um, I, I could um, elaborate on this a bit later on. So Morocco, that was the surprise of the summit. I personally didn't think I would be sitting in the Nelson Mandela Hall in Addis Ababa seeing the King of Morocco walking in uh, applause, not from everybody, but um, standing uh, up at the AU making a speech saying I'm, I'm back to, in the family and I missed you and it was really quite an historic moment. In the run-up, uh, at some point it looked clear as if uh, either Morocco's bid to rejoin the AU would be postponed um, uh, or, or that um, it would be blocked by, by some other countries who very, very strongly argued that uh, Morocco should give some guarantee that the Western Sahara would become independent, colonial borders would be respected. Many of the countries said this is the foundation of the African Union. The respect of the Constitutive Act is about decolonization. It was a very emotional um, debate and acrimonious. Um, a lot of accusations against Morocco that it's coming in now and that it's going to try and expel the um, Western Sahara from the, the Arab um, Sahrawi Republic, the Rust, from uh, um, the AU. So it was, it was a strong debate, but in the end, Morocco came in because the majority of states, a large majority, 39 we are told, wrote uh, to the AU Commission saying that they accept Morocco's request to join the AU. So um, the, uh, um, the bid by Algeria and South Africa uh, argued very strongly that there should be some kind of guarantee on the table that the RAS will not be expelled seems to still be an undercurrent and um, well, what we understand a majority of the states will not agree to expel the RAS. You would need a two-thirds majority vote in the assembly to expel the Polisario Front. So one could in a way say it's a small victory for the Polisario, the fact that for the first time almost ever since Morocco withdrew in 1984, Morocco has accepted to sit in an international body like the AU next to the Polisario Front. It's something that, as, as many people know, it's never um, uh, agreed to do. So many summits, even after Morocco uh, asked to join the AU, um, in, uh, at the end of last year, there was an Arab-Africa summit in Malabo in Equatorial Guinea. And when the Polisario was present, uh, Morocco was to its caused havoc really um, organizing Africa Europe summits etc so um, now Morocco is the 55th state um, a member state of the AU um, the the uh, King's uh, speech was conciliatory he said um, I know this is not a unanimous decision uh, to uh, allow us but he also said, I'm not here to divide you. Um, and he, he made a strong statement about uh, Morocco as, as he said, one of Africa's most prosperous uh, states, has contributed a lot, contributed to peacekeeping, for example, sending troops to the DRC, to um, Central African Republic. He spoke about um, all the economic ties with um, uh, Africa. He, uh, as many people know, um, the King of Morocco has been on this road show these last uh, couple of months, um, making a lot of economic deals, fertilizer plants in Ethiopia, Nigeria, and elsewhere. Um, he also spoke interestingly about uh, regularizing this, the um, situation of some African immigrants. That's an accusation often against Morocco that African immigrants are not allowed in, people don't get visas. 
we'll have to see if, if that um, happens. Um, I think uh, very important for the AU also is the King spoke about the UMA, the uh, Union des Maghreb Arab, the North Africa uh, Union that has not been functional at all due to the, um, the uh, feud between Algeria and Morocco over the Western Sahara. The North Africa region is, is almost not functional. So that will be very important. That's one of the wrecks. So we will have North Africa hopefully getting to some kind of agreement. Um, and the, the King's speech was very personal. Um, interestingly, he didn't use the royal we. He said, I'm happy to be back. I'm back home. I missed you. And um, almost uh, said that, uh, yes, I'm coming home to the African family that his father, a son, a second, left in 1984. So, um, interestingly, just finally on Morocco, one of the implications is that um, Morocco will now be part of the Africa group. For example, uh, if it becomes a, a non-member, a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, and the Africa group stands very firmly on the independence of Western Sahara. So, um, it has some strong implications. It's going to be interesting to see going forward how this plays out. Now, um, Quickly on the on the reforms that there was a high expectation here um, that the reforms that Paul Kagame was mandated to come up with in Kigali last year will bring some fundamental changes to make sure the AU Commission is more effective. Um, and he appointed this group of uh, technocrats: Donald Kabaruka from the ADP, Carlos Lopez from the UNECA, um, Strive Masiwa from Econet. Uh, a panel that really aren't insiders in the AU generally to come up with a report. Now, um, from what we can understand, the, re the report was adopted, but the reforms are really quite um, general. And uh, a lot of it um, repeats what was the, the reform process that, that was um, started in 2007 and really never got implemented. I mean, some of the issues like um, streamlining the commission, fewer um, commissions perhaps, the AU should focus on priority areas, peace and security, political affairs, etc. cetera. Um, the AU knows that, but there aren't any very clear um, steps now. Paul Kagame has asked to, be, uh, to implement this. Um, it also sports, speaks about a professional audit, which the AU has uh, started doing, um, quotas for men and, uh, and women and the youth. Uh, yes, interestingly, only one summit a year, um, which is what, like it was um, under the OAU in any case, um, moving back to that, making some of the summits, most of the summits closed. I think observers, they only want to buy invitations, so won't make everybody happy and um, and some changes to the way the to the election of the um, uh, commissioners but nothing really very substantial we'll have to see when that final report comes out because this was just preliminary and um, and then the implementation will will be key and that is what Musa Faki uh, Muhammad will have to drive um, on the financing as well lots of expectations were created last year at the summit in Kigali that um, this levy, that uh, this plan that Donald Kabaruka was um, leading, the uh, he, Donald Kabaruka is a special AU envoy for the Peace Fund. He put this plan on the table that every region will contribute, will um, impose a levy of 0.2% on all uh, imports and that, then that will um, be ring-fenced, as some have said, because at the moment we've got a system of five um, important countries that are contributing. It used to be Libya and Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa and Algeria. Uh, Libya since hasn't been paying. Now, uh, obviously, Morocco can step in and, and pay what the Libyans used to pay, but still, these are not um, uh, sure funds uh, that the AU can count on every year. It's a struggle. 
So, um, but there was a briefing by Rastas Moensha, the outgoing uh, deputy uh, commissioner of the AU, that said what most people had been uh, predicting, that say, saying that there are some serious technical problems and that some regions still have to look at it. So 2017 is too soon to really say that this plan will be fully operational. Um, the, uh, he said uh, 2017 will be a transition year and he said that some countries like Chad, Kenya, Ethiopia, the Republic of Congo and Rwanda, um, and uh, SACU, the Southern African Customs Union, had already implemented these, um, but then others have um, issues. He also it was asked about um, South Africa's stance towards uh, Donald Trump, the new US president, and he said, well, this decision on self-financing came before uh, Trump was elected, so um, Africa was, the AU was foresighted because now obviously there is that fear that um, US aid to uh, various African countries and operations will be um, cut or at least um, there will be less aid. So just a very few last remarks. Of course, the theme of the summit was on the youth um, the outgoing political affairs commissioner spoke a lot about this. Um, she was asked, for example, about um, social media. She said, she admitted that last year a number of countries, including Chad actually, um, cut uh, social media and internet during elections and she said um, this raised concerns and it was captured in the uh, election observers reports of the AU of elections in Africa. But she also said that social media should be used responsibly and um, radio stations, for example, can have a negative impact, referring to Rwanda and uh, the Radio de Milko Lin, as we know, that was negative propaganda during the Rwandan genocide. But yes, um, she didn't sound very convincing, but surely this is, this is somewhere where the AU can um, make a stand um, on upholding democracy. So just a few general notes on the summit. As I said, um, a lot of it was achieved in a quick, very quick um, uh, space of time because the decisions were made Monday by six o'clock. Morocco was in, Musa Faki Mahmoud was elected. Um, by Tuesday, the king was making his speech. No one expected it to, to run pretty smoothly as it did. Um, but of course, there are, there still remains a lot of divisions within the AU um, and it came out with the issue on Morocco, especially divisions um, and um, a lot of enmity. I think the Southern African group lost out quite a bit, uh, especially South Africa. Um, it's, it really didn't have uh, its voice heard on the Western Sahara issue. Uh, there are rumors that South Africa supported Musa Faki Mohammed in, uh, in the third and fourth rounds when the, the southern candidate from Botswana, Benson Motoy, fell out. The expectation initially was that most Anglophone states of southern and east Africa would support Mah uh, Amina Mohammed. Um, but all in all, um, I think some states leave the AU summit with uh, some bitterness that uh, the, there wasn't that much consensus and um, and the, it is really now up to the new commissioner, the new chairperson, and the new AU chair. Um, oh yes, uh, I, I forgot to mention Alpha Kunde, uh, who I said has institutional memory. He's, um, he's been around for a long time as opposition leader. When uh, the closing ceremony happened and Muhammad Sis the sixth made his speech, Alpha Kunde um, said something uh, conciliatory in the sense he referred to the ANC's brave struggle against apartheid the, and in Algeria and the Polisario Front, he mentioned almost as an overture to South Africa and Algeria um, saying, well, you lost out on this one, but we do recognize your contribution to the continent. Uh, as the king was still um, standing there to make his speech. So, so that was quite interesting. Of course, then Tlamini Zuma um, made her farewell at the AU. 
um, saying all the obvious things. Um, it was a, an honor to serve the continent. And she was actually, just to fi a final note, she was actually the last one um, to, um, she was only the only one to mention the new measures by, the, by Donald Trump to keep um, refugees from certain countries out of the US and said, um, you know, what is Africa going to do about it? None of the others actually mentioned that. 